studies in the life of a man after God's own heart. Studies in the life of a man after God's own heart. We've been studying the life of David for several weeks now. And uh, one thing we've learned is that David is human. He's just like you and I. He's made out of the same stuff we're made out of. Which means there's some good and some bad and some ugly. <laughs> A lot more good than there is bad. This morning, though, we're going to look at a different side of David in that David is in many ways a type and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to see where we were, we're going to begin... Um, we're going to begin in verse 10, 1 Samuel chapter 21, 1 Samuel chapter 21, beginning in verse 10, and David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Well, folks, again, let's ponder that for just a moment. He had, he's, he's fled to Israel for fear of Saul, and he's landed in the land of the Philistines. Yeah the mortal enemies of Israel, it was David who killed their champion, Goliath. Yeah. And he's running to them for refuge. That don't make no sense, does it? Sometimes you and I can do things that don't make much sense. Yeah, 
That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Well, let's continue to read uh, verse 13. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned or pretended himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his spear. Do you get a visual there? Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Listen, folks. Under normal circumstances, he would have had David uh, killed under normal circumstances. But this was not normal. Why? Because David was under the protected hand of the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Hey, folks, some of us would already be in the grave yes. were it not for the protecting Amen. hand of the God, yes. of our God, our Amen. heavenly Father. Amen. Now, so verse 1, what happens? Chapter 22, we're just going to read two more verses. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to these two verses. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men yeah. wow. so keep your bible open we're not going to read any more but we might refer back to that in our text again our main title is studies in the life of a man after god's own heart our subtitle today is foreshadowing foreshadowings of the Christ foreshadowings of the Christ by that title I mean that we can look at David and see images of the Lord Jesus Christ David prefigures David foreshadows the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to see how as we get into our text let's go to the Lord once again folks and beseech him to give us understanding today. Father, we once again come before thy throne of grace, seeking grace to help in our time of need. Lord, you, you bid us to come boldly to that throne of grace, and you bid us to pray for understanding. You bid us to pray for knowledge. You bid us to pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Lord, as best as we know how, we do that today. We pray you would give us understanding as we seek, Lord, to understand your word, that it might edify us, build us up in the faith. Oh God, open thou our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy word today. And we'll be grateful and enable your preacher in Jesus' name. Amen. When we began this study a few weeks back and were introduced to the person of David, as a young shepherd boy, right away we saw in him many admirable qualities of faith and godliness and goodness that we all who know Christ would do well to emulate or seek to emulate. But then as always is the case, the enemy reared his ugly head and began to stir up trouble and opposition and persecution and we watched as David panicked and took matters into his own hands. He reverted back to the old man and the old nature. And we all do that from time to time. And he began to traffic in lies and deceptions. We watched as his faith failed and he resorted to conduct unbecoming of a child of God. Still and yet, God showed himself to be ever gracious and merciful on David's behalf. 
He stayed the hand of the Philistine king, Achish, who surely would have otherwise had, have had David killed on the spot. And he allowed David to escape unharmed to the cave known as the cave of Duhlam, and there alone with God in that damp, dark, dreary chamber, David came to himself and he came to the end of himself and that cavern became a sanctuary and a prayer closet and a place of great spiritual renewal and revival. He's in a cave, folks, all by himself, a dark, dusty, dreary, damp cave. Sometimes God allows us to get in some bad places so that he might get us in some better places down the road, so that we might learn something while we're there. And so uh, in this cave, we know because David writes several of the songs from that cave. The introductions tell us that. And they're some of his best writings. So here in this cave, all alone with God, David begins to get things right with God. We know from the introduction to the various songs that David wrote at least three of those songs from this cave a doodle during his time hiding out there. Now let me begin by saying that David had already been anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. That anointing had already taken place. But he wasn't quite ready to be king just yet. And as we said last week, our faith must be tested in the fires of adversity so that it may be tempered or made strong by those same fires. Are you listening? Yes. Our faith must be tempered in the fires of adversity so that they might be made strong through those painful experiences. God is always faithful and God can always be trusted to show up and, uh, and to show himself mighty on our behalf in every situation. Likewise, folks, we have to learn often through very painful experiences to lean not unto our own understanding. And that's a very, when we do lean to our own understanding, it can be a very foolish, very dangerous mistake. And so here in our text, along with those three songs that David wrote while in the cave, we can see the fulfillment of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 5, where he wrote that we glory in tribulation, Amen. knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Now that goes against everything that we've kind of come to learn through life. We, we don't glory in tribulation, but we should. Why? Because we said we glory in tribulation knowing that tribulation worketh faith or patience and patience experience and experience hope. I've been saved 47 years. Amen. I've had enough tribulation over those years to teach me something that God will come to my rescue. That tribulation has taught me that I can depend on him. That's called experience. He said, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. What's patience? The word patience means the ability to bear up under a heavy load, under a burden, under a heavy burden. It's the ability to keep on going. He said, tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And experience hope. Man, when you get in trouble and you and you can look back at how God's been faithful in the past, it gives you hope. That experience gives you hope that He's going to be faithful in this present situation that you find yourself in. 
And James said exactly the same thing, James chapter 1, where he wrote, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or testings. Knowing this, not hoping this, not thinking this, but knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And again, what's patience? It's the ability to keep on going under a heavy load. He said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But he said, let patience have her perfect or completed work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. Let patience have. You mean it's up to me? Whether or not patience is allowed to have her perfect or completed work? Yes, yeah, up to us. As long as we're living by faith. You see what happened to David? David panicked. He panicked. And when we, we talked about all that last week. I don't have time to re-preach it. But he didn't let patience have her perfect work. He panicked. And he first fled to Ahimelech. Then he lied to Ahimelech and got all those people killed. Then he fled to Achish, the Philistine king. Listen, when you panic, you start making bad choices Amen. and bad decisions. Amen. So he said, let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Someone once asked George Mueller, the great British preacher, he had a great big orphanage. Man, every meal they ate, they ate by faith. Yeah. One day they were didn't have nothing to eat. There were several hundred children in this orphanage. This is back in the, I don't know, 17 or 1800s. Brother Paul, you yeah. might know. Early 1800s. Eight, early 1800s. Had no food to feed those children. Had all those children go to the table. The table was set. But there was no food to feed them. Yeah. So they begin to pray. And there's a wagon making a delivery of bread. And the wagon is a curve in front of the in front of the orphanage. And the wagon tips over in front of that orphanage. And all that bread flies practically inside the door yeah. of the orphanage. As they were praying for bread. I'm telling you, that's faith. Amen. Someone asked George Mueller, he said, what was the best way to have great faith? Listen to this. George Mueller replied, the only way to learn great faith is to endure great trials. He said, I've learned my faith by standing firm amid severe testings. I have learned my faith by standing firm amid severe testings. Testings. Again, James said, but let, per, let uh, patience have her perfect, and that word perfect means completed work. Now, none of us like trouble. None of us like distresses. None of us like necessities. None of us like persecutions. But they're all part and parcel of the process of developing you and I into rock-solid unwavering, unmovable, steadfast people of faith, which greatly honors and pleases the Lord. Can you imagine, I, I can just see Jesus looking down on George Mueller that day when he had those children gather around those tables and begin to pray. George knew somehow, some way, God was going to meet that day. And I can just see Jesus looking down old George, at old George, grinning like a mule eating briar. Oh, he's just so proud. Hey, it pleases God when you and I live by faith. Amen. It pleases God when you and I trust Him. Amen. Not by not by sight. Now, it's easy to praise things when we when we can see the answer, but it's when we can't see the answer. That's living by faith. That's what. Pleases God. Without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. But living by faith. And so here in our text, David has been stripped of everything. He has nowhere left to turn. He has no one left to turn to but God. And quite frankly, my brothers and sisters, 
That's a good place to be. Good place to be. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, For when I am weak, then am I strong. For because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Glory to God, more often than not, it's at rock bottom that we're privileged to witness firsthand the glory of God. And again, my subtitle this morning is the subject foreshadowings of the Christ. As we've noted before, David in many ways prefigured or foreshadowed the Lord Jesus Christ. And nowhere is that more evident than it is here in our text. Let me give you a few examples and we'll go home in just a few minutes. First of all, like David, Jesus had already been anointed to be the king of Israel. That's uh, his titles, the Messiah. Did you know that the word Messiah means the anointed one? Yeah. Did you know that the Christ means the anointed one? Yeah. Jesus has already been anointed to be not just the king of Israel, but the king of kings and Lord of lords, the king of the world. Amen. But it hasn't happened yet. Like David, many years of sorrow and suffering must pass before he actually ascends the throne of Israel. David has already been anointed to be king as well, but it hasn't happened yet. Where's he at? He's not in the palace. He's in a dirty, dusty cave. Like David, the leaders in the ruling class of Israel would hunt and hound and persecute and seek to kill David. Isn't that exactly what happened with the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ? The leaders hated him and despised him. And every day they gathered and took counsel how they might kill Jesus. And eventually they did kill Jesus. You recall that he said in one instance, like, now here David, here David is in this tech, in this uh, cave. In other words, he's homeless. Once again, he's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ because you recall that Jesus said in one instance that the birds of the air have nests and the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He literally was homeless, just like David now in this cave. In the Gospel of John, we are told that every man went unto his own house, but Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. He slept in the Garden of Gethsemane night after night after night. Here in verse 1 of our text, the Bible says that David, quote, departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulum. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Now, David, at one point, just a few weeks back, was the most popular man in all of Israel. But his popularity has gone. When Israel found out that King Saul was seeking to kill uh, David, his popularity took a nose down. In John chapter 6 and verse 66, we are told that from that time forward, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus at one point was the talk of the town. Jesus at one point had multiplied thousands following him. But on this day in John chapter 6, when he started talking about being the bread of life, the bread which Moses talked about coming down from heaven, uh, the Bible says that they began to leave. They began to turn away. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, uh, will ye also go away? I mean, all that was left was the 12. And Jesus said, will ye also go away? Then Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 
And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Those faithful followers, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, were his brethren by virtue of the new birth. And they were members of his father's house. Again, I want you to see the parallel between what's going on in David's life now and what was going on in Jesus' life. There's a, there's a distinct parallel. Finally, this morning in verse 2 of our text, we see another striking parallel between David and Jesus. Not only did David's brethren and all of his father's house seek him out in the cave of Doom, but, quote, everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them. Folks, is it not exactly the same with Jesus? Typically, men and women do not seek after Jesus unless they're in some kind of distress. Yeah. Uh, whether it be spiritual, physical, economic, mental, or emotional, you read the four Gospels, and you'll see clearly that for the most part, it was the poor, it was the needy, it was the blind, it was the halt, it was the withered, it was the maimed who uh, typically came to him for help, for healing, and for comfort. Once again, typically the rich, the influential, the learned, the mighty, the ruling class of the nation had no heart for Jesus whatsoever. Not only are we told that those who were in distress came to David. But those who were in debt, I, I'm reminded of an old song that goes something like this. Since he paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song Amazing grace, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Amen. Every single one of us, folks, were debtors when we came to Christ. Every single one of us had the penalty of death hanging over our heads because our sin debt was so insurmountable. We were all spiritual paupers and beggars. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. Not only did everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt come to David, but verse 2 of our text tells us that everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them everyone that was discontented that word discontented comes from a hebrew word that's defined as to be in bitterness everyone that was in bitterness brother paul came to david now it also means to be in heaviness of heart likewise folks it's only those who are in heaviness of heart that come to Jesus. It's only those who are in bitterness that come to Christ. Those who find this world empty to satisfy. Those who are, who are in heaviness over their sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted and like the hated and the homeless King Jesus David also himself became a captain over this ragtag bunch the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2 10 that quote for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. King Jesus, hey, 
Here in our text, David becomes a captain over this ragtag bunch of 400 people that's come to him to the cave of Doom. Well, again, likewise, King Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He is our commander in chief. We get our marching orders from him. Finally, in verse two of our text, we see one more very striking parallel or foreshadowing of the Christ. There it says, quote, and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. Think about that with me for just a moment, folks. David was the most famous man in all of Israel. The, even the Philistines had said, is, is, this, is not this the king? He weren't the king yet, but they were regarding him as the king. He was so popular. And uh, David was the most famous man in all of Israel. But when word got out that King Saul was trying to kill him, his popularity took a nosedive. And the number of those willing to be identified with him fell off exponentially. Only 400 out of several million people gathered unto David. Let me ask you a question. Was not and is not the exactly the same thing, same thing true of the Christ? Out of the multiplied billions of people on this planet, only a paltry sum, by comparison, are willing, yea, eager, and proud to be identified with the Anointed One, the Son, the soon coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, again, I've said it last week, I'll say it again this week, Jesus himself said that straight is the gate, or narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction, leads to death. Many there be that find it. The Bible says in first, in, not first John, but the Gospel of John, chapter one, verse twelve, said he came unto his own, and what happened? His own received, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Amen. Only a paltry son came to David, four hundred out of the millions of Israel. What's that way with Jesus, King Jesus? Only a paltry sum by comparison come to Christ. Most take that broad road that leads to destruction. In closing, let me ask you a question. What about you? Do you know him? Would you like to know him? You can, if you qualify, or you're distressed. Do you realize that you're in deep spiritual debt? Are you discontented? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor in the heavy laden. He said, now we'll give you rest. What a blessing. What a blessed day it was. 47 years ago when I came to Jesus. I fit all of these. I was bitter. I was in debt. I had a huge sin debt. I was in distress. Thank God he came to me. Amen. And I became one of his army. Amen. I joined the ranks of the followers of Jesus Christ. Hey folks, we are a uh, minority. One day we'll be the majority. And uh, won't it be wonderful there? Well, I hope you've seen some of the, some of the similarities, parallels between our type in King David and the fulfillment of that type in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's interesting to look at these things, to study these things, and to see them. Brother Paul's a wonderful 
for doing that. And he did that with Joseph recently. Many types of the Lord Jesus in the Bible. And uh, it's fun to look at those. All right, Brother Paul, come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. We're going to stand together.